Okay. My name is uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute, and on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our coffee and politics session today. We uh, are honored to have with us a, uh, uh, our guest, Alfred Mealy, who is the Workmeister Professor of Philosophy at Florida State University, where he's made significant contributions to the study of the philosophy of action. Dr. Mealy earned his PhD from the University of Michigan, and he has published widely on human behavior, free will, and the concept of autonomy and self-control. He's published over uh, 60, or uh, either written or, or edited over 16 books and more than 400 journal articles or encyclopedia entries. In January 2010, Dr. Meadey began directing a multi-year project that focused on big questions in free will, funded by a four and a half million dollar grant from the John Templeton Foundation, which probably made him a very popular philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that project studies the concept of freedom through the lens of science, philosophy, and theology. Dr. Meadey also has been awarded uh, seven fellowships from the National Endowment of the Humanities to further his contributions to our understanding of freedom and autonomy. Joining me now in welcoming Alfred Meadey. Thank you. And, uh, Thanks for having me. Is this microphone working? Or, well, okay, good. Sounds good. Uh, this is a brand new talk. I, I don't do. Um, I don't work in public policy, and I, I don't work in ethics. Um, I guess I'm a theoretical kind of guy, and uh, I do a lot of work with science. So what I thought I would do is talk about some uh, data that really is relevant to public policy and then maybe you can tell me how to be pragmatic about it. I'm going to talk about a, a certain kind of threat uh, to the idea that we're able to make uh, informed, conscious decisions in a wide range of situations. And that ability, the ability to make informed, uh, conscious decisions in a wide range of situations is presupposed by any system of ethics that I know of. and. Uh, public policy systems, too. So uh, where does the threat come from? Last night I talked about a threat, related threat, that comes from neuroscience. And I um, did my best to debunk uh, that threat. This threat uh, comes mainly from social psychology. And uh, it comes from situationist studies, which are really fascinating studies and, and go way back. And uh, you have a handout, right? So I'll read you this uh, quotation on situationism uh, from a relatively recent article. If a social psychologist was going to be marooned on a deserted island and could only take one principle of social psychology with him, it would undoubtedly be the power of the situation. All of the most classic studies in the early days of social psychology demonstrated that situations can exert a powerful force over the actions of individuals. If the power of the situation is the first principle of social psychology, a second principle is that people are largely unaware of the influence of situations on behavior, whether it is their own or someone else's behavior. Now one take on this is that our behavior is driven entirely by the situations in which we find ourselves and we are unconscious of the forces that move us. And if that's true, uh, then we don't make informed conscious decisions. We're more like zombies, say. And we'll get to the zombie idea a little bit later. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is talk about three classic studies, well to begin with anyway, that uh, Lieberman had in mind in that quotation. And we'll see, we'll get a sense of what the threat is, and then we'll think about what we should do about it. Um, so I'll start with a, with a bystander study. This was uh, motivated by an episode in New York City. Uh, Kitty Genovese was killed uh, on a street, and according to news reports, there were many witnesses, and no one called the police. And uh, apparently it was being witnessed from apartment windows above the street. Okay, and so you wonder everybody would wonder, why wouldn't anybody call the police? It's uh, an easy thing to do. And uh, some social psychologists decided to do some controlled studies to figure out what was going on there. And I'm going to talk to you about this bystander study. So the setup was this. 
the subjects were college students and they were told that they would go into this room by themselves and talk over a microphone to another person, uh, just about college experiences. And then what was really going on was that uh, they were hearing a tape-recorded voice, the subjects were. And the voice uh, started saying, oh, I'm about to have a seizure, I'm in serious trouble, uh, stuttering and so on. And this lasted for uh, two minutes and five seconds. I don't know why it lasted exactly that long, but it always did. And what they wanted to see was whether the subjects would leave the room and go get the experimenter to help. And sometimes the subject believed that he was the only one who could hear the voice. This is the one other on the handout, so the one other would be the speaker. And sometimes the subject believed that he and another person could hear the voice, and sometimes that he and four other people could hear the voice. Now it turned out that whether subjects helped depended on how many other people they thought could hear the voice. So you can see sort of the bystander scenario. Uh, and here are the findings. When they thought that only they could hear the voice, 85% left the room during that two-minute two span to get help. Uh, when they thought that one other person could hear the voice, 62% left the room in that two-minute span. And when they thought that four others could hear the voice, it went all the way down to 31% who left to help. Um, in that first group, Group A, all of them eventually reported the problem. That is, some, some of them after the two minutes were over. But in the third group, Group C, only 62% eventually reported the problem. So 38% never even said a word about it. Okay. So with that kind of data, you can see that the situation is having an influence on the percentage of people who are going to help and you have to wonder why. Now, if you think in terms of good reasons, you should think, well, that there are four other people around who can hear it, or three, or one, really shouldn't have any effect at all on whether I help. I should help anyway. And that's not the way the behavior is going. So the behavior is influenced by the situation. Okay, that's one study. It's a very nice, well-designed study. Um, the Stanford Prison Experiment was uh, was a very interesting study. Uh, what they did was to advertise in newspapers in the Stanford area for uh, volunteers to take part in this mock prison experiment. And they got plenty of volunteers. And uh, some of the subjects were assigned the role of guard, and some were assigned the role of prison inmate. And uh, it was actually sort of a, a high-powered study. So they, they drove out to these people's homes in police cars, drove them to the Palo Alto police station, and then to this prison that was built in the uh, basement of the Stanford Psychology uh, Department. And um, the study was supposed to last for two weeks, but the experimenter had to cancel it after six days because things were really getting out of hand. Uh, there was a lot of <coughs> bullying. Um, the guards made prisoners wash toilets with their bare hands and just a lot of nasty stuff. And I'll read you some quotations from some of the reports on the study. They're here on the handout. Uh, five prisoners had to be released because of extreme emotional depression, crying, rage, and acute anxiety. One prisoner had to be released after 36 hours owing to extreme depression, disorganized thinking, uncontrollable crying, and fits of rage. Uh, then there was... Um, a subject who felt sick, a prisoner, somebody in the prison role, and uh, he went to talk to Zimbardo. This is what Zimbardo says. I suggested we leave, but he refused. <laughs> Through his tears, he said he could not leave because the others had labeled him a bad prisoner. Even though he was feeling sick, he wanted to go back and prove he was not a bad prisoner. At that point, I said, listen, you are not number 819. You are whatever the, the kid's name was, and my name is Dr. Zimbardo. I am a psychologist, not a prison superintendent, and this is not a real prison. This is just an experiment, and those are students, not prisoners, just like you. Let's go. He stopped crying suddenly, looked up at me like a small child awakened from a nightmare, and replied, okay, let's go. 
So what happened here is that these young men were so sucked into their roles that the guys who had the roles of guards, about a third of them anyway, became really serious bullies, and the guys who had the role of prisoners behaved like uh, prisoners. They had two hours of free time every day to do whatever they wanted. Uh, all of the conversations were recorded secretly, and 90% of the <coughs> conversation was about prison life. Can, can you imagine that? So they're so sucked into the roles that they don't even talk about their real life outside of the fake prison. They talk about what it's like in prison. It's astounding. Um, okay, so their behavior is seriously influenced by the situation in which they find themselves. Then there's the, the really famous Stanley Milgram studies of obedience. Uh, I wonder how long I should go on about this. How many of you know these Stanley Milgram studies about shocking Oh, not many. Okay. Uh, these are fascinating. And, you know, people worry about replication sometimes. Milgram did many, many versions of this, and the results are quite uniform. Um, so the cover story here is that the experimenter is doing um, a study of memory and uh, the connection between memory and pain, actually. And the experimenter wants to know whether if you punish people uh, for wrong responses to questions, uh, their memory will improve. Okay, that, that's the cover story. And um, they got volunteers through the newspaper again. And uh, volunteers go into the lab, and they meet another guy who they think is another volunteer, and then they pick a piece of paper out of a hat to determine who's going to be the teacher and who's going to be the learner. But actually, the learner is always a confederate of the experimenter, and the teacher is always the volunteer. Now, uh, the volunteer teacher goes into this other room and sees this thing that looks sort of like an electric chair. And it's got a, a strap on it uh, to hold the guy's hand down, so the learner's hand down, so the learner you know, doesn't jerk around too much when he gets shocked. And, um, then the door is, the, the subject leaves the room and the door is closed and the subject is in front of an array of 30 levers, each with a voltage number ab above it. And the levers are mainly divided into segments of four. And here are the labels over these segments. Um, well, once you get to about number 20, it's intense shock and then extreme intensity shock and then danger, severe shock, and then at the end, triple X. <laughs> <laughs> and triple X is associated with a voltage of uh, 450 volts. Now, most people you know, don't know anything about voltage, so that's not going to move them much, but danger, extreme intensity, shock, things like that will move them. Now, of course, it's a psychology study, so there's no actual shocking but the subjects are led to believe that they really are administering shocks. And uh, there's very good evidence that they really did believe it, almost all of them. <laughs> okay, so, um, so every time then the learner gives the wrong answer, the subject is supposed to shock him and supposed to increase the shock uh, with every wrong answer. So it goes from uh, 15 volts all the way to 450 volts. In the original study, the door was closed, and so you couldn't hear the learner. Okay, so you didn't have that kind of feeling for him because you couldn't hear him. It was all behind a closed door. Um, and how many people shocked all the way to the end? 26 out of 40. Okay, so that's what, 62.5%. Okay. Now, some of this stuff is on video, and you can see how nervous these teachers are. They're thinking, geez, I could be killing the guy. What should I do? Shouldn't I stop? And the experimenter had these canned responses. There were four canned responses. The first response was, the experiment requires that you continue. And uh, most of the time, if the experimenter just said that in a very calm voice, uh, the person would continue shocking. If the person asked again, well, shouldn't I stop? You know, I might be hurting the guy. Uh, the experimenter would say, uh, it is absolutely essential that you continue. Um, and then eventually, 
uh, if the person persists in asking about stopping shocking, we get to the final response, you have no choice, you must continue. Um, and a lot of people heard that, they kept on shocking. Uh, if they said, no, I'm not going to do it, then the experiment stopped. And then fortunately they were debriefed and told, look, you weren't really shocking the guy up until this point, you're not shocking him. And people uh, felt very relieved, of course, that they hadn't done it. But as you can imagine, they also felt kind of bad about themselves because here they were, you know, doing this sort of thing for no good reason. I mean, how could uh, an experiment on learning and pain justify uh, hurting people? Okay, now if you're curious about what motivated uh, Milgram to do these studies, uh, he was curious about why ordinary German citizens became torturers in World War II. Um, okay, now what you might think is, okay, but those people were behind a closed door, you couldn't really have empathy because you can't see them and you can't hear them. So here's another study Milgram did. Uh, this one is called uh, Voice Feedback. And so you can hear the person who is supposedly being shocked. And that person was, was a pretty good actor. Now here's my description of it. I'm actually going to read my description. This is for um, a little book on uh, free will that I wrote for the general public that I think should be out this year. It's called Free. And, uh, you know, people think I, I can't write in an accessible way because I'm a theoretical philosopher. I'm just proud of this bit of text, and <laughs> that's why I'm going to read it. So um, here's a description of the voice feedback. The learner grunts in response to the 75-volt shock and the slightly later ones. At 120 volts, labeled moderate, he shouts and says the shocks are becoming painful. He groans after the next shock and refuses to continue in response to the one after that, the tenth shock. This goes on with increasing intensity for several more shocks. At 180 volts, the learner screams that he cannot stand the pain. By 270 volts, he is screaming in agony. At 300 volts, the twentieth shock, he desperately shouts that he will not provide any more answers and he repeats this after the next shock, after emitting a violent scream. After all subsequent shocks, he shrieks in agony. Okay, and now, so it was 26 out of 40 who shocked all the way to the end in the first study. What would you guess in this one? You'd probably guess quite a bit lower, but no, it was 25 out of 40 who shocked all the way to the end. This is astounding. <coughs> um, and what would be the justification for shocking? Well, we'll learn something about the connection between memory and pain. You know, could that really do it? Um, so what we have here is powerful evidence of a strong urge or desire to obey authority. And then what you might think is, oh, you know, this was done a long time ago when people were more obedient. Uh, <laughs> but uh, similar things have been done more recently and we get uh, similar results. Okay, so this is more evidence of the power of situations. So those are three classic studies. Uh, I'm going to talk about two uh, much more recent studies and I'll be much briefer about them and then we'll get to what we should think about these studies, what we should think about these findings or results. Uh, so here's one, here's the eyes flowers thing from 2006. Uh, it's on the handout. And it was, uh, it was just a, a coffee or tea room in England. And uh, what you were supposed to do is pay a certain amount for the tea, a certain amount for the coffee, a certain amount for the milk. And uh, the experiment ran for 10 weeks. And sometimes over the price list, there was a strip that was a picture of flowers. And sometimes, for, like for the next week, for a whole week, over the price list, there was a strip that was a picture of eyes and you'll see the results. Uh, so 2.76 times more money was put in when the eyes were watching than when the flowers were watching. Now what's going on there? So that's a difference in the situation. It's just, you know, what the picture is and it has a huge effect on behavior. What's going on? Well, it could be that, you know, the eyes give you the sense that someone is watching but not the conscious sense, um, and so that affects your behavior. And you have no clue, of course, 
that you're putting in more money because there's a picture of eyes rather than a picture of flowers. So there again, you have the influence of the situation on behavior. Uh, then there was a nice study done with uh, the dictator game. In, the, in this dictator game, um, the subject gets 10 bucks, and he can uh, distribute it in uh, $1 increments either to others or to himself. And in one condition, you see those three dots. In one condition, you have uh, three dots on the video monitor that the guy is watching when he makes his distribution uh, in the shape of a face, so two eyes and a nose, and sometimes inverted. And here are the results. By the way, this did not work on women, just on men. Uh, I'll say something about that in a minute. But in the case of men, when the dots were in the face shape, uh, men donated on average $3 as opposed to $1.41, so more than twice as much. And uh, they do donated a dollar or more 79% of the time, that is to others, uh, as opposed to 30 way. Um, oh, whew. I'm sure I did that. It's like I have magical powers all of a sudden. <laughs> 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 I think. I'm sorry. Do you have the, the like bass? It's bass, yeah. This is an experiment. I know. <laughs> How do I respond to this situation? If I had juggling balls, I'd start juggling. <laughs> you don't need this to hear me, but this is being recorded. Okay. So. We okay? Yeah. I'm just impressed with how quickly someone Yeah, I know. I thought everybody would just stand around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so where was I? Oh, I know. Um, so what should we think about all this? Well, there are two different perspectives we could have. We could have a pessimistic one, and I'll read you a couple quotations in that connection, or we could have a more optimistic one. Um, so for the pessimism, look at this. This is a quotation from Kilstrom. Uh, Some social psychologists embrace and promote the idea that automatic processes dominate human experience, thought, and action to the virtual exclusion of everything else. And these automatic processes are, you know, unconscious processes. So Kilstrom is saying some people in his field, he disagrees with them, by the way, uh, think that uh, experiments like this show that our behavior is really driven by uh, forces that don't come up to the level of awareness, like uh, the influence of authority or being a bystander or how the dots are arranged or whether it's eyes or flowers. Um, and this is from a science writer. In navigating the world and deciding what is rewarding, humans are closer to zombies than sentient beings much of the time. And the idea about zombies is, I don't know anything about zombies really, but I guess there are all kinds of TV shows. They're supposed to be unconscious. So that's the idea here. We're like zombies in the sense that we're unconscious of what moves us. Okay. Um, that's one way you can think about it. But there's also an optimistic spin on it. And I'll start with an anecdote. Um, the day after the 9-11 disaster, a friend of mine said to me, that will never happen again. And I asked him what he meant. And he said, well, look, now that we see what happened, uh, airplane passengers will never again let it happen. That is, they'll you know, assault the attackers and uh, prevent them from doing it. Now, his thought was motivated, I'm sure, partly by the newspaper stories about uh, United Airlines Flight 93, where supposedly passengers um, did resist. And there is something to it, but notice what this thought my friend had depends on. 
It depends on the idea that we can learn from other people's experiences. But that learning isn't unconscious, it's conscious and it's thoughtful. So you think to yourself, what would be better? Um, should I just sit there or do something about it? And then you think too, look, if I try, other people will try too. That's the way people are. Um, now, if, let's think about uh, airplane passengers in this connection. I think I fly between 70,000 and 100,000 miles a year. So if there's anything I know about, it's being an airplane passenger, which isn't the most wonderful thing. But what are you supposed to do as a passenger? Well, you're supposed to sit in your seat, keep your seat belt on until they tell you you can take it off and get up. You're supposed to be obedient to the airline employees and not cause any kind of trouble at all, right? Um, so if something nasty happens on an airplane, we already know about the bystander effect, and um, we already know about an obedience effect. And so people are very likely just to sit there and hope that the uh, airline employees handle it. But that's how you're going <laughs> to act maybe if you don't think about what you should do. But in light of information about what's happened and your knowledge of the bystander effect and obedience to authority effect, you might think, no, I have to overcome all that and do something. Okay. So that's um, sort of, you know, thinking about this in a positive way. So people like reading news about, you know, surprising scientific discoveries. And one way to spin the news, and the way this kind of news is often <laughs> spun is, and so look, you're zombies, or it's hopeless, uh, you can't do anything about it. But another way to spin it is, okay, now that you know about this, what will you do about it? What can you do and what will you do? And I think um, news should sometimes be spun that way. And actually, I do write things for the general public, and I do this kind of spinning, uh, because I think it's productive, but because I also think it's accurate. It gives you a better sense of the kind of control uh, you have over your behavior. Um, I'm going to be quicker about this than I thought I would. So take a look at this quotation from Milgram about obedience. Uh, this is toward the bottom of page two. In growing up, the normal individual has learned to check the expression of aggressive impulses, but the culture has failed almost entirely in inculcating internal controls on actions that have their origin in authority. For this reason, the latter constitutes a far greater danger to human survival. So what Milgram wanted to do was not only to demonstrate the effect of this desire we have or habit of obeying authority, but also to do something to change it. And he thought the best way to change it was through education. Now, it's, it is important in a society to instill obedience to authority figures in children, but you don't want it to go so far that they won't question authority when they should. Um, I mean, this kind of thing can be associated with child abuse and so on, where children think, oh, that's an authority, you know, I can't do anything about it, I can't even report it. Um, I don't know exactly how this uh, proper education about obedience to authority should go, but I will think about it. And people um, who know more about policy and so on uh, should think about it and should think about how, how to improve things. Um, okay. Now, so this is speculative, this positive stuff I've been saying, but there is some relevant uh, hard evidence, and I'm going to go through that pretty quickly. There's something called the implicit association test. And uh, well, here's one, one way it goes. So you get black faces and white faces, and you're supposed to categorize them as black or white. And you get positive terms and negative terms. And it turns out that when you're categorizing, if you're white, and you're categorizing black faces, if a black face is paired with a positive word like generous, something like that, it takes you longer to categorize the face as black than it would otherwise. And what this is supposed to show is a kind of implicit racism. Um, now, you've got to wonder how much this implicit racism would affect behavior and so on, but the idea is that this is subconscious behavior, and so there's nothing you can do about it. You can't overcome your implicit racism. 
um, you can't show a different result on the test. And so one question is, is that true? Is this really not subject to our control at all? Um, and I'll just talk about two studies really briefly where the subjects were told, look, you know, these are the results you're giving. Uh, see if you can do something so that you don't give these results, so that you're not slower when the word is neg uh, when a positive word is paired with a black face. <coughs> Although in this case, this study was done in um, Germany and it was done with Turks instead of blacks. Uh, well, there are a lot of Turks in uh, Berlin, for example, because they went there to rebuild the country uh, after World War II, and there's some prejudice against Turks. Um, okay, so I'll just read you the, the result of one of these studies. Oh, first I should do this. So gaming the test, not showing the result just by slowing down across the board is easy. So you can just tell yourself, hey, I'll wait two seconds before I categorize a black face as black or a white face as white. You, know, you just go slower and uh, you're not affected by whether the term is positive or negative. But can you speed up your response to a black face or a Turkish face uh, when it's paired with a positive word? Uh, yes. So let me just read you this result. Conscious intention to speed up responses to incongruent pairs, improved response time from 903 milliseconds to 734 milliseconds. That's about three quarters of a second. So that's by 169 milliseconds. Taking the test the same number of times, that is just practice, improved response time a lot less. So the conscious intention to speed up your responses to the uh, Turkish faces when they were paired with positive words had a significant effect on time, on reaction time. Um, I should say something about the ability to do otherwise, too. So the way some people spin this news about situations is, hey, look, you can't do anything about it. You're a victim of your situation. It drives your behavior. There's no aspect of it that's up to you. Well, if that's the way it were, then everyone in the same situation would do the same thing. But you never get those results in these studies. right? You never get anything like it. So uh, think about the bystander study. The figures were 85% in one condition who helped, 62% in another, and 31% in the third. And they were all in the same situation, all the subjects in the experiment. They were in one of those three situations. They didn't all behave the same. They behaved differently. And you can change the percentages, I think, of people who help by means of education. Now that you know about the bystander effect, uh, what do you think you'll do the next time you see uh, an old woman slip and fall in the mall? Or a, a blind person trying to cross the street uh, who's having trouble? Are you just going to stand there and watch, or are you going to help? And will it matter to you how many other people are around? Uh, it shouldn't anymore, because now you know how it works. And you know it's up to you what you do. Um, OK. Now, the last thing, back to zombies. I should watch a zombie show once, so at least I know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so Dan Wegner, who unfortunately died not long ago, a great guy, uh, but I disagreed with him about almost everything, but still he's a wonderful guy, claims that uh, conscious intentions are never among the causes of corresponding actions. So if that's right, then you know, we can't really make informed conscious decisions that affect our behavior because if they're going to affect our behavior, they have to be among the causes of that behavior. That's what affecting is. Um, but actually, there's strong, hard evidence against this. And I'll give you just three examples involving implementation intentions. An implementation intention is just an intention to do a thing at a particular place and time. That's all it is. So it's a very simple thing like an intention to exercise next week on Tuesday right after work, say 6 o'clock, 6 until 7. That's an implementation intention. I'll tell you quickly about three studies. So there was a study uh, featuring breast self-exams. And uh, the experimenters got only women who were highly motivated to do them on a regular basis. And they were all told about the importance of doing them. And the, uh, the women were divided into two groups. And one group was told, in addition, OK, and before you leave the room, uh, the experiment room, uh, decide on a place and time to do the breast self-exam next month, uh, and then write it down for us just so we have a record of it. In that, and the other women were not given any instruction like that. In that study, 100% of the women given that 
instruction, did a breast self-exam the next month, and all but one of them did it at basically the place and time they designated in writing, and 53% of the others did. So that's a huge difference, and the only difference at the cause end is the conscious intention, and maybe the writing it down. Okay, so the conscious intention is doing some work. Sure looks that way. Here's one done with uh, exercise. And people were told about the importance of doing exercise. Uh, they went on about that. Uh, they were divided into two groups. And one group was told to pick a place and time to exercise for 20 minutes next week. And the other group wasn't given that instruction. And 91% of the implementation intention group uh, did exercise the next week at, again, basically the place and time they chose, only 39% of the others exercised next week. So there again, the implementation intention has a huge effect on behavior. It's a conscious intention. Uh, and then there's kind of a cute one with uh, recovering addicts who were about to go on the job market, and they were supposed to write a resume by the end of the day. And they were divided into two groups. Uh, half of them were told to pick a place and time to write a resume that day before 5 o'clock. And half, the other half were told to pick a place and time to eat lunch that day. So you, you wanted that really in the control condition because now you have this extra matching instruction, but they're different in both cases. 80% of the addicts in the implementation intention group about the CV uh, wrote one by 5 o'clock, and none of the other ones did. So 80% versus zero. And the difference there, again, is the uh, is the conscious intention, this implementation intention. That's evidence that conscious intentions do causal work. But I guess zombies don't have conscious intentions, so it's evidence that we're not zombies. Um, all right, and then just a quotation from a meta-analysis. Uh, this was published in 2006. Findings from 94 independent tests showed that implementation intentions had a positive effect of medium to large magnitude on goal attainment. So this is a result we get again and again and around the world. Um, so I agree that situations do have a powerful influence on our behavior. I don't agree that situations turn us into zombies. I think we have a lot of control over our behavior. And I think the more we know about how we're influenced by situations, the better. Because the more we know, the better job we can do of counteracting the negative influences of situations. Situations also have positive influences, too, that are unconscious. And those we should leave alone. Just let them work. I mean, they work just fine. It's the negative ones we should worry about. And that's the end. So we have about uh, 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Shall I call on people? Yeah, or? OK. Yeah, so um, if we could go back to the Milgram study for a second. Yeah. And I realize he you know, summarizes so he may already have an answer uh, thought up for this, but I'm just thinking about this uh, uh, sort of from the point of view of the person who's doing the shocking and observing the person who's being shocked. Uh, and um, uh, the conclusion that you uh, offered, at least through Milgram, was that uh, this reflects a sense that people, uh, the authority is, is a big component in decision making. But uh, I would think that, that one of the assumptions going in, being a participant in the study as well, they're not going to kill anyone. They're not yeah. going to. They're not going to injure anyone. So there's a, there's kind of a presumption of some level of safety. That, you know, maybe. It, it's painful to the person right now, but I'm not really harming them because they wouldn't let me do this. Otherwise, there would be no, you know, NSF money for it or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, whereas the extrapolation to, let's say, the Holocaust issue is in just uh, in thinking here quite different because uh, one important component of that was precisely that harm would be done to these people because there's inculcated. Uh, in the populace a sense of resentment against that group to begin with, number one. But in, in spite of that, there's still a removal of the, um, <coughs> the subjects that, of, of the Holocaust, that is to say those people who were actually the um, uh, recipients of uh, genocidal action because they were moved off 
uh, into camps and stuff like that, which were outside the direct eye of most people. So in that mm -hmm. sense, in both of those ways, it's different from the from this study because this study is precisely you have to be visually and auditorily connected with the experience that you're watching this person suffer. And, uh, and you have no reason to cause suffering to them except that you're told to, to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also have kind of an assumption probably as they're going along, well, if we're really bad, sort of like going to the dentist, you know, and the dentist yeah. reassures you and says, uh, don't worry, I'm not actually injuring you even, and the noble cane will eventually kick in, you know. And you say, well, you know, he's a dentist, he knows what he's doing, I guess yeah. he'll go with it for a little bit longer. You know? Yeah, yeah, there, there's definitely uh, something to what you said quite a bit. So part of what the subjects were told is that although the shocks would be quite painful, they would cause no permanent tissue damage. Okay, so um, that makes a difference, right? So you're thinking, well, I'm hurting the guy, but you know, it, it's not going to be a long-lasting kind of thing. Uh, also, to <coughs> test, well, part of the idea about authority is they did a lot of this at Yale, uh, which is prestigious, but then they did it at uh, sort of a place outside of. Yale, and the experimenter wasn't as well dressed, and things were kind of shabby, and so on. And they didn't get as high rates of shocking all the way to the end in that case. So that sort of thing makes a difference too, partly for reasons that you mentioned. So you might be thinking, if you're a subject at Yale, hey, these guys know what they're talking about. They're not going to have me kill anybody, right? Uh, that is part of it. It explains part of the effect. Um, Milgram did a version of this where a guy said that he had a heart condition, and then he kept talking about his heart condition when he was getting shocked. And he still got pretty high rates of shocking. Yeah, I know. And so, you know, what's going on there? Well, you know, there's another kind of trick in this experiment, too. But I don't mean to debunk this one at all. I'm, I'm really impressed by it. If you get somebody to start off with uh, 15 volts, then nothing happens. You know, there's no response to it at all. That makes it easier for him to pull the next lever the next time, which makes it easier for him to pull the third lever, you know, when we get to it. Whereas if you just had him start at triple X or whatever, you might find people not even starting. So that, that's kind of a salesman's trick, salesperson's trick, where bit by bit. Oh, uh, yeah. It gets easier over time. Artists. Yeah. Uh, unless they're zombies, then, you know, it's totally different. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've been an economist, if you count the time I was a student, for half a century, and economics is built upon people making calculating choices. We maximize our satisfaction, our utility, or our profit, if we're a business person. And uh, you see a lot of examples where people don't do that. But some economists now, including some old ones like Kenneth Boulding, are saying oftentimes people aren't just calculating profit maximizers or utility maximizers, they do things out of love, out of altruism. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're Christians, or they do things out of coercion. In a lot of societies nowadays, you see that people do things because an authority is telling them you must do it. Mm -hmm. You will suffer severe consequences. So um, <clears throat> it seems to me that if you expand the range of choices, you know, calculations, love, and coercion that people are responding to different situations. Mm -hmm. and, and different motivations too, yeah. right. So they're not just, as it were, calculating utility. There are other things that come into play. Right. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, there are all sorts of influences on behavior. All sorts. And they don't depend just on the situations around us, but also on what we're like internally. Mm -hmm. Like some people are more loving uh, or empathetic than others, you know, and that's going to have an effect on behavior too. And when you em when you emphasize the situation too much, you ignore this part about personality differences in people. Um, I don't know what I should have a decision procedure. I usually do left to right, so I think I'm going to do left to right instead of trying to keep track of the order of hands. And so, yeah. Mm-hmm. And as someone who has said stuff to object to that, what do you think the sociological or psychological influences there are there that are motivating that rush to what seems to be make hasty deductions from these kinds of tests? 
Yeah, okay. You know, I'm afraid my attitude toward this is a little bit cynical, but this is what I, th I think is going on, at least in significant part. What impresses journalists? Radical news. What's radical? Oh, we have a lot of control over our behavior, or we're zombies. <laughs> well, we're zombies. And um, so, for one thing, then, that's the kind of news or spin on these studies uh, that's going to go public. And then another thing is, you know, a certain percentage of academics like a lot of public attention. And so I think they're drawn to, th this is kind of cynical, but I think it's true. They're kind of drawn to the limelight, and they have a sense of what's going to get them there. And it's not going to be, you know, the sort of commonsensical attitude, yeah, we have free will, we're morally responsible, we have quite a bit of control over what we do. It's going to be, we're zombies, or we're just automata, or things like that. So I think that explains part of the rush to that judgment, but also in psychology, much more so than in philosophy, I noticed these big swings. So we're all the way at one end, and then we go all the way over to the other end, and you know we don't stay in the middle too much. Um, and I don't know exactly why that is, unless it's just sort of excitement, or, or what's going on is that you're trying to falsify the dominant view, and so you go to the other extreme. Um, something I think John Barge does. You know, he's, he's way at the automaticity extreme. Whereas, you know, it seems to me pretty obvious, and I'm not a psychologist, um, so maybe my opinion doesn't count, that human behavior is driven by a mixture of automatic and conscious processes. And then what you want to know is how do they mix and what are the mechanisms. But that's not so exciting, right? Uh, that's not going to make the news. Um, Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think the, the relationship between consciousness and uh, free action is complicated and subtle. And what you're going to think about this relationship is going to depend partly on what you think free will means. But, um, you know, I think, so I'm in the habit of uh, signaling for my turns before I make them because, you know, that's what my dad taught me to do and it's just a habit. But um, I would be happy to say the way I use freely, that I freely signal for my turns before I make them. And so the last turn I made, I think I freely signaled for it. But I, I'm sure I didn't consciously signal for it because my attention is occupied with other things. So I think there can be uh, free actions that you're not even consciously <coughs> performing. But I think the freedom sort of traces back to earlier free actions that were consciously performed like when I was trying to avoid being slapped in the back of the head, because that's how my dad taught me to drive, I would, you know, consciously remind myself, okay, signal for the turn before you make it or you're going to get slapped in the back of the head. And um, so I think there's this kind of tracing. And so I, one thing I think is that if a being never consciously made any choices at all and never consciously performed any actions, that being would never act freely. But I don't also think that every free action has to be a conscious action. And that's what I mean about it being kind of a, a subtle connection. Now, um, there are lots of different views about what free will means out there in the world. And so, you know, I can get into a lot of arguments saying this. But what I try to do is to accommodate the leading contending views of what free will is and try to assess the evidence for the existence of free will or against it on each of those conceptions. But yeah, thanks for the question about consciousness, because we might just have opened a can of worms, but maybe somebody will just change the subject. We'll see. We're about <laughs> to find out. Yes? Um, so I think a couple of times you've mentioned uh, kind of an opposition between either we have control or we're zombies, and then you went to the conclusion that we're not zombies. And I 
wonder uh, if there isn't some middle ground that, and I wonder why your paper might be titled not um, a preface to paternalism. I mean, it seems like a lot of what <laughs> yeah. you're pointing to is that we can learn if we're given the right instructions and so on, and after we've uncovered these cognitive biases and blind spots. <coughs> and so I wonder if you don't see this, your talk is sort of suggesting a lot of motivation for a resurgence in paternalism. And af after all, is it the, the situation thing is just representative mm -hmm. of all sorts of a uh, huge catalog of these biases, right? And can we really em embrace that catalog and still say there's something like a virtue? Well, okay, that, that's that's a few different questions, I think, together, but, but that's fine. Uh, is there something in between uh, zombiehood and whatever's at the other extreme? Sure, and you know, so we're all in between. Um, and some of the time we're on automatic pilot, and some of the things we do are results of automatic processes, like my signaling for turns, say, or pressing the gas pedal when I see a green light, or you know, hitting the brakes when I see a red one. All that stuff is relatively automatic, at least after a time. Uh, paternalism, I don't know. See, I haven't actually worked out any kind of policy or plan. Um, what I did was object to the negative spin that you see in the news on these findings. I think that's unjustified. And I suggested that you could just as easily put a positive spin on it, which would be more productive. I did talk a bit about uh, how we should educate children about obedience to authority, but you know, I don't know how that should go. Paternalism sounds bad to me, so. Uh, but I don't know if this is paternalistic or not. I am getting old, so maybe, maybe finally I've become. And I think that's good news. I, I like that news to come out. But I don't do it in any illegitimate way. I just talk and try to be persuasive. OK, how are we doing? Uh, we got five more, five more minutes. Yes. You know, I talked a bit about a rerun of the uh, implicit bias test. Yeah. Have any of the other situationist type studies been redone where there's a sort of elaborate behoaxing at the beginning? Just so you know. Oh, yeah. In the past, people have been influenced by a dime in the coin slot. Yeah. I mean, you made a claim. You, yeah. were, you were suggesting that if we spin it in a positive way, that'll change the result. Yeah. That seems to me to be empirically verifiable. Do you know if it's been done? Have no, I, fun studies? I don't believe it has been done. See, such a study would be hard to do. So suppose you tell people, hey, you know, this is the bystander effect. Yeah. This is how it goes. Exactly Here's an experiment we did. And now we're going to put you in this room, and you're going to hear a voice. Uh, you, then they, they know too much. Psychology always experiments always involve deception. So now these people, now the game is up. These people know what you're testing and you, you can't really count on their behavior as indicative of any kind of truth. But wouldn't that be testing the real life situation if your work gets widely publicized and people learn about things like the best Yeah, effect? yeah. And then they can do sort of the conscious override that you're suggesting might yeah. be so valuable for um, avoiding zombie hood. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's doable. I, I'm just trying to think now of how I would persuade a psychologist to do this kind of thing because I know the first thought the psychologist is going to have is, how the heck am I going to get anything that works here when, when the subjects know what I'm doing? But if we, could, if we could find a way, we educate a bunch of people about the bystander effect, and then we just stage an accident. So they have no clue what's going on. We stage an accident, see what they do. Yeah, that's doable. That, that would be interesting to do. I do have um, another big grant coming in the contract. I thought it was going to be signed today, but probably next week. It's another four and a half million thing. This time it's on self-control. Uh, zombies don't have self-control, right? So we can, we can do it. Okay, good idea. <laughs> I just have to... <laughs>
<laughs> oh, and there's so many hands up. I'm, I'm going to go with the with the oldest hand. <laughs> That's my new rule. Yeah. Well, rather than suggesting that, uh, as you seem to be doing, that that um, being zombies is bad and and being in control is good, and that the press is putting the emphasis on being zombies. Mm -hmm. um, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Isn't it more a case that for most of the things we do, we're zombies because we couldn't possibly face every um, decision through rational thought. We just didn't have time or the mental capacity yeah. to do it. Yeah. So instead, most of the things we do just because we're zombies, because somehow unconsciously we do it. And the few things, we have the luxury of deciding rationally that we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so the question is not whether or not we're zombies, it's how do we decide which things are worth our conscious thought and which aren't? Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I've, I've thought about this. So what percentage of our behavior, our intentional behavior, is zombie behavior and, and what percentage is not zombie behavior? And by zombie behavior now I just mean automatic. So then, you know, what you have to do is you just think about the things you do in a given day and how often you need to make conscious decisions about what to do and how often you don't. And probably most of the things you do in a given day that even that you do intentionally don't require any conscious decision. A lot of it is habitual, uh, some is brutally automatic, and so on. So yeah, I think, I think fine, uh, we are zombies a lot of the time. But when it gets to more important things, we make conscious decisions. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And it would be a waste of time. Uh, in, in fact, it would be a certain kind of psychological problem to make conscious decisions about things where you could just pick arbitrarily. Like you go to the supermarket and you want to craft macaroni and cheese, and there are 50 million boxes of it. Should you inspect each one to see which one is the best and then take that or, or just pick one? And people who have problems with decision making sometimes will stare at these boxes and try to find a reason to prefer one over the other. That's a problem. Um, so yeah, lots of things. Or you have your favorite route to work. If it's not blocked, you know, you just drive there. You don't decide which way to drive to work today. And that's good. You save time. So yeah, I agree. Um, but the, the way this is spun, it goes beyond that, beyond just the useful automaticity to, hey, you never make a conscious decision. Or if you do, it has no effect on your behavior, which is extreme. Our time is up. Before I ask you in joining me in thanking our speaker, uh, those of you who want more information about Foley events or who might be here for a class, there will be some sign-up sheets out in the, lot, in the foyer out, out front here. Otherwise, I want to thank you for coming out today and join me now in thanking our speaker for a very interesting time. Thank you.